science and society meeting and what could be broader than more or more representative of what we're trying to do with this meeting than to have a, a session where we bring together art and science. Where's it going? <laughs> and so our next uh, conversation is about that topic. It's called Intelligence in the Light of Art and Science. And may I welcome on, uh, on stage the panelists. It's going to be moderated by Max Tegmark. And we have, hi Max. And we welcome back Maybrit Moser and also the Icelandic artist Olafur Eliasson. And come here. we're going to have, Frank, you're going to have to drive around back here. So if you could turn around and follow me. Okay. <laughs> Hello. Hi, Frank. Hi. You, if you can come around the back of these chairs. Yeah. Can you do that? <laughs> okay. Great, so it's... There's your parking space. Just a warm come welcome. If you come, come round, round more. <laughs> turn, turn in here, follow me. Oh, fantastic, a little bit more forward, okay. you're all set. Thank you. <laughs> but then we don't see him. Yeah, excellent. <laughs> well done, Frank. Welcome to Göteborg, Frank. <laughs> so it's great. It's, it's a great honor and pleasure for me to be here. And, and we have a great diversity in this panel, not merely in terms of background with, with neuroscience and art, but of course, but also in other ways. The, the bitterest of rivals, Norway, Sweden, Iceland, Denmark, <laughs> we're all here together. <laughs> and Frank adding Cambridge, Massachusetts to the mix as well <laughs> to talk about intelligence, art, and science. And uh, it strikes me that one of the hallmarks of artificial intelligence and natural intelligence that we've heard a lot about today is the ability to recognize patterns in the world around us and to study these patterns and to make representations. And this is something which you both have done such wonderful work with in your own ways. Maybe you by studying the patterns in the hippocampus of rodents to see how they represent Space, space around them, and, and you have created such incredibly elaborate patterns in the art world. So to explore this connection between art and science, I would like to start to ask you, Olafur, how has science and, and thinking about intelligence inspired your art? Well, more generally, I, I look often at science to see what they come up with with regards how to verbalize with what on earth they're doing, because obviously, I think what is exciting is that the subject matter can be so incredibly abstract and, and, and on one side and on the other side, um, <laughs> do you hear me, Frank? Yeah, uh, I, wanted to, I wanted to get the body language too, though. So yeah, I'm yeah. Right. cheers, <laughs> cheers. I'm here. Um, Hi, welcome, hello. <laughs> so Sorry I'm, to be the distraction. Not at all, okay. not at all. Yeah. I'm super focused now. Um, <laughs> but. So the point being, so for instance, in cosmology or in uh, deep astrophysics, I guess you call it measuring of deep space. I mean, it's so exciting to see how do they come up with a terminology that somehow covers the stuff that they're, they're trying to uh, somehow, uh, how do they map with regards to mapping what they're working on, right? Because it seems that the, one of the limits is simply to imagine what they are working on. And so as an artist, I look into them because, you know, essentially it has to do with abstraction something really abstract, and then they have to apply words, algebra to some extent, models, visualizations, experiments, onto this. And I'm very curious because obviously it's like spacing the unspaceable, adding space to something. And for that they bring about, you know, patterns, like the one you uh, successfully um, evolved. And, and, and as an artist I'm very curious in that. Yeah. And let me ask the, the same corresponding question to you, Maybrit, then. How has art inspired your science, would you say? I think as humans, we depend on art because it gives us... I know that you don't like that, that I say that it gives us pleasure, but it's challenging at the same time, and that is part of the art, that it's challenging. Why would I not like and, that? And, and, and I think that is what we see in science too. So when we saw uh, these grid cells that we discovered in our lab, that you have cells that just expand throughout the environment, and the cell knows how, 
when it should be silent and when it should not be silent. And it creates a pattern that looks like a hexagon. Looks, that's, a, lot like that's, your, looks a lot like your handbag there, actually, yeah. doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> With the hexag uh, hexagonal uh, grid pattern. I, I think that is kind of of art just to see that. And you, you have to, to have this creative mind in order to see. And I think that is what hopefully we share, that we have eyes that can see something that is... Uh, yeah. I, but I think, so, so I totally agree, but we also have to see there is an, there's a potential for criticism in this, in the kind of how do we then evolve? Because what we make the mistake and often think is that the grids, the patterns, the architecture, the urban planning, society at, at a whole, we take it for granted as being natural or static and non-negotiable. So the learning exactly. in this is, of course, once you can understand alternative patterns as a model, you can also apply that and realize that what we normally define as reality, Max, are you listening? What we normally define as reality is, in fact, uh, cultural and, and, you know, very much relative. And so there is a critical potential once you discover, a, let's face it, a new model. It's not that the new model represents reality. Mm. It is the critical potential that that has onto what you normally took for granted as being real, which then suddenly is not so real anymore. Yeah, so, so the, that is so exciting with, with the brain when we re record these cells, because sometimes I've told myself, oh, this cell should respond to this environment in this and that way. And then I suddenly think about this response as what the animal is thinking. And of course, that is not true. And also when we discovered this uh, grid cell, we first thought of it as a universal pattern that was hardwired, inherit. But then we see that environment can change this pattern and the geometry of the environment can change how this is expressed. Mm. Interesting. Yeah, very interesting. Now, on the same question, Frank, <laughs> you've thought a lot about the relationship between art and science. In fact, you yeah. just wrote this book where the core premise is that maybe we should think of our universe out there as, as a work of art. Yes. Do you want to tell us a bit about how, how you see art related to science and how this inspires you? Uh, yes, I have a couple of things. Let me address the audience. <laughs> He's polite. <laughs> yes. One thing is that uh, it's naive, I think, although it's common to think of the brain as a single organ. The brain, the human brain, actually has many different subunits that uh, have different strengths. Uh, a lot of our brain is, develop is devoted to visual processing, and we're very good at it. Uh, and that's a lot of what uh, art is about, cultivating that part of the brain and, and catering to its strengths and interests. Uh, science is a lot about ca uh, uh, calculating and kind of analytic operations, logical operations on the world. But bringing those two very powerful parts of the brain uh, into a common dialogue it can be extremely fruitful. There, uh, it has been very, very important uh, in the history of science to have good visualizations. And conversely, uh, ideas like perspective, where one thinks logically about uh, the nature of, of vision and brings uh, analytic concepts into uh, art, have been very fruitful. So that the, the bringing the different parts of our uh, capabilities, different ways of viewing the world into harmony so that they can speak a, speak a common language and interchange their strengths, I think is a tremendously important uh, thing. Then it also happens to be a blessing that the world, uh, when deeply understood, does embody principles like symmetry and the idea that you can use patterns simple patterns in repeated uh, forms to generate rich uh, structure that are, is appealing, that, that those ideas, uh, are, that, that uh, those ideas which are at the root of the scientific understanding of the world are also ideas that very much uh, are in the history of art 
and in centuries and of our traditions. Yeah, very interesting. Do you have any reactions, either of you, to? Well, Frank I think said? that I think it's it's healthy to to see if one can look for systems. But as an artist, I obviously also keep a door open for the potential that some artistic patterns, if you want, are really not really um, explainable or quantifiable. You know, an artist might choose to suggest that a particular handshake is a work of art, and whether that fits into a pattern or not. You know, so art can also really be, um, let's say, an exchange mode. Mm. So, so, I, so, so, um, so with regards to art and science, I think there is a lot in common, but I also think we should celebrate that there is something which are not in common. Um, <laughs> and I'm very interested in creativity as such, because as we live in a culture where the, uh, let's say, success criteria is very much the objectification of creativity. What have you achieved? What is the goal of your achievement? What is the goal of the education? We heard about that earlier. Whereas a lot of creativity lays really in the causal nature of the process of doing something, so mm -hmm. the bridging, and I guess that's so interesting for science, also the work that one does bridging the gap between an idea, making a sketch, a model, and so on and so forth, until the ideas finally brought into, let's say, action, so th from thinking to action, that is maybe where the creativity uh, is actually um, inflicting the world mm -hmm. or being touched by the world. And, and I think one also needs to nurture the fact that non-quantifiable success criteria, the process, is where maybe we need to look for art and science potentially also. Um, and and, um, and that's why I'm a little generally a little bit afraid of you know, let's let's try to map the principles of saying where is art and where is art not because maybe uh, I am or somebody better than me is about to you know find out it is not quite where we hoped to find it. Mm. Speaking, go, yeah, go yeah, no, I, I just want to compare it with uh, basic science and applied science. So if, if you have symmetry, then you feel pleasure and it looks so beautiful. But art is also challenging and you don't know the end result probably sometimes. And that's the same with basic science. We know that there's something very important, but we don't know how this can be applied in 10, 20 years in the future to human beings and to help humans. And that is the bonus that we got in our work. We, we just wanted to understand how these cells in this GPS system in the brain worked. And then suddenly it seems like these cells are essential when people get Alzheimer's disease. Yeah. So that's the symmetry, the beauty. But we didn't expect that, and mm -hmm. we, that was not the aim of our work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I have a follow-up question for you, Maybrit, about this, it's the unexpected. One of the hallmarks of, of great art is that it elicits a strong emotional response in, in the person who experiences it. And I'm mm. so curious, when you and Edward, for the first time, saw these hexagonal triangular patterns in your data, Viewing it just as a work of art, you must have been very surprised. Can you just describe like, the emotional experience when you saw this as an artwork? What went through your mind? No, so, 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 uh, so I have to, to, to say that this is not only Edwards and my work. It's, it's a big group of people uh, that we're working together sure. with. But, of course, we had this Areca moments. And, and at different times. And I remember I was getting this computer program one of, uh, from one of our students, Stella Molden, who made me able to analyze this. And then I suddenly saw this pattern. And I said, this is not biology. <laughs> You, you, you can't get this in, in biology. It's so regular. You can fit equilateral triangles in. And then I started to test all different kinds of other cells, and they didn't show this. And I was just, wow. <laughs> Oh, that's the best response you can get as an artist, isn't it? Yeah. Wow. And we're over time now, so I think that's a perfect note on which to end this panel. I just want to also say that if any one of you happens to be at the Nobel banquet tomorrow at the City Hall in Stockholm, look up, because it, it might just so happen that there is a new <laughs> star there that you've never seen before. And if you see it, it's his. <laughs> and that might be another opportunity to go, 
Wow. So thank I? you so much. <laughs> I want to make a selfie with you, Frank. Can I do that? <laughs> so funny. I mean, <laughs> let's thank so uh, our panelists it, yeah. here, all three of us. <laughs> so this is great. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Let me just get it on him. I'll take it. Frank. I'll help you. Take it. Oh, that's great. I will put it on my Instagram, Frank. <laughs> take a meta okay, selfie. Okay, great. Cheers. Selfie, I'll, give me, I'll, I'll give you my email so you can send it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Cheers. Excellent. All okay, right, let's thank all well. three of our panelists it's again. Great, it's great to meet you. And, thank uh, you. Say hi to Betsy. <laughs> thank you. Okay. <laughs>